All right, good evening, everyone. This is Peter Smallage. I'm the New York State Extension Forester. And I'd like to welcome you to this webinar on March 18th, 2020. We're in the midst of a pandemic, the COVID-19 coronavirus, and we are practicing social, was it social distancing? What's the word I'm looking for? Social distancing, I think, yes. Which we've done here with the Cornell webinars since 2007. So hopefully you are all healthy and safe and socially distant, especially from anybody who might be infectious and taking all due precautions. All right, so are you seeing one screen, one, one slide or two slides? Okay, one slide, very good. Okay, so tonight I wanna to talk about uh, best practices and activities for small wooded acres. And uh, this is, I think this is a, a fun topic because the overwhelming number of private woodlands are what most people would consider as small. And so more than the, the median point uh, is, is very low, has, is at a very low acreage, which means that uh, there's a large number of people that own small parcels. Now that said, I'm not going to, how do I advance this? Usually I don't have to worry about this. Usually I have a speaker. <laughs> I've lost my chat window. Let me bring it back up. This isn't cooperating. All right, we're gonna go with, I can't see the chat window, so we'll forge ahead. So um, today, my goal today is to suggest what I'm thinking of as some universal woodland activities for small parcel owners. And there's two caveats in this first goal. First, I'm saying universal in quotes, because I think uh, anybody that's a woodland owner or a forester could identify some activities that they would think of as universal that that would potentially be of interest if not to all woodland owners to a great many woodland owners so i'm not wanting to suggest that i have the corner the market cornered on what are the best practices the only best practices for small parcel owners um, i hope that i've gotten some i've captured some that are going to be of interest to uh, many of you. The other thing I'm not going to define is what a small parcel is. I think that's really um, in in the mind, in the context of whatever the owner is. And it might be a five acre parcel, or it might be five acres on a 500 acre parcel, or it might be a 150 acre parcel. So whatever an owner thinks of as small is going to become a small parcel. The average parcel size in New York is something around 30 acres, and oftentimes we hear statistics about forest management on parcels that are larger than, say, 10 acres or larger than 20 acres. So all of you fit somewhere, either as an owner or as a forester who works with owners on these parcels. Second goal I have is to hopefully answer some questions you might have about the ecology and management of your woods. And we'll use the word management very broadly. It's not just going out and cutting trees, but it's doing things that are important to the long-term well-being of your woods. Uh, it's, it's some active role. It may be on a planning level or on an, on an observational level, but that can still be considered management. I'm also working with the assumption that um, you have ideas about your woods, that you've been out and you've seen things, and you have, uh, um, you've been paying attention to the plants and animals in your woods. Um, and you're curious about what's going on, and you're wondering what you can do, if you should do something, if you shouldn't do something, maybe what the best course of action is. Um, I'm also assuming that you either have or can talk to your neighbors. I think that's one of the key parts of ownership, and, and with a small parcel, you may have many neighbors, 
And the more of them that you can become familiar with, I think the better in the long run uh, for the experiences that you will have. And then finally, I'm assuming that you want to learn more about things like your woods and the management of your woods and hopefully about safety. And truth be told, safety is really what motivated me when I started thinking about uh, you know, working, you know, do-it-yourselfers, working in the woods and small parcels and things like that, because, because oftentimes it's not feasible to get a commercial operator, whatever that activity might be, to do the things that you want or need to get done, and so you have to do it yourself, uh, which is fine. You can learn how to do that, but it's essential that you do it safely. Another piece of context here is that I want to um, <laughs> my computer screens are not cooperating. I, I want to characterize two of the, I'll say four types of owners. And if you go to the engaginglandowners.org website, which you see at the top of the screen, you'll see that they actually identify four different profiles or typologies of owners. And it's important to, I think for people, especially that work with woodland owners, to understand that there are different uh, lenses that landowners look at their land through. And even though we can categorize these and make these boxes, and in my case, I have a line that's drawn down between them, I don't want to give the impression that there's not overlap. And many people that are, let's say, woodland retreat owner types or working the land owner types um, have crossover. And there's a lot of things that they enjoy doing that are characteristic of other types of owners. And so my suggestions tonight are gonna to be, I hope, applicable in both cases. Um, and, and in both cases, it's a matter of being active. And I want to encourage you to be as active as you can be in your woods uh, for, a, for several reasons. Uh, one, activity is relative, so what you do is active may be different than what your spouse does is active, which may be different what your neighbor does is active, and it's all activity, and it's all good. Um, and it's also scalable, and so you can do some things at a small scale, maybe for, you know, on an, on an acre level or a quarter acre level or a five acre level or on a 20 acre level, um, and some of those things will apply throughout. It's just fun to be out in the woods. I took a, as I was saying earlier, I took a drive through the woods uh, before the session tonight, and it was just, it was just nice to kind of reacquaint myself um, with the woods. I've spent all the last three months in the woods because it's sap season. I won't do sugar bush research, um, but it was just nice to get out and see some new and different trees. By being active, you're going to learn about the ecology of trees and plants and mammals and birds and herps and insects and everything else that's happening in the woods. And each of these are an entity unto themselves and each group is a, I think, and we're gonna talk about this more, is a group of biological organisms. And so the, the, the principles of biology that apply to populations, so a population of sugar maple trees or a population of chipmunks, uh, those principles of biology are going to apply across many of these different uh, taxonomic groups. Ecological principles are scalar, and so the things that you hear about um, happening at very large scales, sometimes even global scales, but certainly you hear about these regional ecosystems like the Chesapeake Bay watershed or the Lake um, the Lake Ontario watershed, or these kind of very large ecosystem. Uh, processes and principles also happen at a small scale in many cases. And so you can go up to a stump, a tree that used to be a tree 20 or 30 years ago and now is a stump and it's in the process of decay. And that is an ecosystem because it has this interaction of many biotic groups um, all in one place doing things and providing services. And then finally, the more active you are, the better able you will be to advance your conservation goals. And everybody has some kind of conservation goal and whatever that might be, the more you know about your woods, the more familiar you are with the woods, the better you can plan for and carry that out. So what are you gonna gain? I think there's probably uh, three level of potential benefits. And I have some of the benefits that are associated with these practices are I'll say universal and that's what I have uh, I'm trying to indicate by the picture of the hemlock woolly adelgid. 
almost everybody that I talk to is interested in tree health and forest health at some level. Hopefully you don't have hemlock woolly adelgid in your woods, but as, a, as, a, as an image of forest health, we're gonna be talking about things that relate to the health and the resilience and the diversity and the stability of your forest. There are gonna be common benefits that many people, I hope, are gonna realize from this presentation. And there are gonna be some, maybe some personalized things that you're gonna zero in on that are really particular to you. And hopefully there are several of those. Um, one of the, one of the activities or the benefits that is common to many people and which uh, really got me thinking about how we do education and how we could connect to landowners is the utilization of firewood. And this was a survey that we did probably about 15 years ago and we published it about 13 years ago. And we were looking at um, owners based on categories of how they pursue forestry information sources. So we had owners that were very active in their pursuit of forestry information and we had defining characteristics and we had some that were passive and so they were a little not quite as aggressive and then we had unengaged which doesn't mean that they weren't learning things or not doing things on their property but that they just weren't connecting in the standard sorts of ways that we were thinking. And across all of these, the overwhelmingly most common activity for people during the next five years was something related to firewood. And so firewood is a really awesome activity. We're gonna talk about it later uh, because it, it teaches you the ecology, the interactions of trees. It teaches you about um, how forests grow and how there are some trees that grow faster than others. It teaches you that there's a a high value to some trees, economic value, and a low economic value to other trees. It teaches you how to manipulate your woods if you're inclined. So there's just, there's a lot of things that come together around firewood. And because it's very common, it seems like um, a good way to kind of draw people in. But it was that, it was that feature that made me think more broadly about what are people doing on their land? And this, this data, these data are for people of all different parcel sizes. When I talk to anyone and try to help them understand what's happening with forest management, the analogy to that, that I use is to uh, relate woodland management to gardening. And uh, this is a picture of a great garden out of Otsego County, I think, New York. And it's neat because the owner is also a woodland owner and there's uh, the woodland is behind the garden, but there are so many parallels of gardening with woodland management that it's worth uh, specifically calling out some of those similarities. First is that you have a goal and the goal is all important. Uh, the goal with this particular garden is a high level of aesthetics. You can see lots of pretty flowers. There's also some productive plants that you see on the back left side. I think maybe those were blueberries, if I recall. And so there's some specific plan and design for how things are going to happen where. And this garden is sectioned into portions where we have the productive, the, the fruit productive plants versus the aesthetic productive plants. And so there are goals and you do the things that satisfy your goals. And so the, the underlying assumption with all woodland management is you start by saying, here's what I want for my property. And then when you see or hear or I say or your forester says or you read about in a magazine, you can do this, you can look at that as a either opportunity or temptation or as a non-starter because it's not something that aligns with your goals, your ownership objectives. So that's important. Woodland management and gardening is all about plants. Plants have roots in the soil and so we have to be able to make sure that those uh, roots are healthy and that the soil is providing the mineral nutrition and moisture that those plants need. And we're conscious that plants have leaves and that those leaves are critical for photosynthesis. So plants create their own food during the growing season and then they store that food in their root system and some in their stem during the dormant season. So we're just coming out of the dormant season. So the trees and the plants are becoming very much alive over the next few weeks. 
that's important. The photosynthesis is important because sunlight is the most limiting factor. And so when we're managing our garden and we're managing our woods, we're really managing sunlight and which plants get sunlight. Those that get the sunlight are the winners and they're going to be favored. We also have a crop, whether it's beautiful flowers or blueberries, that's gonna have some mixture of weeds. And just as we have that in our woods, we have crop trees that produce something for us, uh, acorns for wildlife or timber or aesthetics or shade. And those crop trees that we're growing into the future may be competing with weedy plants for sunlight. And so we can think about how to manage those. Woodlands and gardens have both visual and productive appeal, and both of them can be managed at whatever desired level of input you have. The garden that we're looking at has a fairly high level of input. I, I think that's probably obvious. I know I've had gardens that don't look anywhere near as attractive as this. And the same with your woods. You can be the kind of a woodland owner that walks on the trails and pretty much all you do is maintain your trails and that's great because if your goal is is just to walk in the woods then you're satisfying that goal. The first um, activity that I want to suggest and I've numbered these just in the sequence in which you will see them so they're not priorities, they're not uh, sequential steps that you should take and in fact some of them you're going to ignore and that's quite all right but it's just these are things that I think are worth mentioning as best practices across the board. The first is to get out and meet your neighbors um, and I'll say the first with the caveat as I emphasized before that it's essential that you have ownership objectives because what you want to do when you meet your neighbors is to communicate with them why you own your property and why it's important to you and learn and listen from them. And you don't have to agree with them. You don't have to necessarily be supportive of the things that they want to do. But if you know what they're interested in and they know what you're interested in, that's a start for uh, uh, understanding how that, that neighbor relationship can function. The sooner you can do that, and particularly in a calm, kind of atmosphere is great because at some point there may be a conflict come up and it's much easier to know the person by name and have met them once than to first meet them under a point of duress. An important part of neighbors is boundaries. You know, I say good fences make good neighbors, well-marked property lines make for good neighbors as well. It, it, it takes away the ambiguity of where am I and whose property am I on. And there are uh, different ways to mark your property boundaries. You can see the tree on the left has been previously scarred. You can see, if I can move my cursor, you can see the, uh, the scar tissue and then that's that that blaze, it's called a blaze, has been refreshed with yellow paint. The tree on the right has some red markings indicating a property line. And there are different ways you can do it. I would strongly encourage you, and some states require that before you go out and blaze or paint your boundary, you have it uh, surveyed by a licensed surveyor. Minimally, you wanna talk with your neighbor and make sure that if you don't have a legal survey, that you agree on the location of that boundary. And then mark it. Once it's marked and you both agree on it, it's a whole lot easier than to know where you are and where your neighbor is supposed to be and you're supposed to be. The second thing that I'll encourage you to do is to learn the flora, learn the vegetation, learn the trees as trees, learn the trees as seedlings, uh, learn the shrubs, whether they're native or non-native, desirable or undesirable. So knowing all of the plants is important. Uh, you have, and I've broken this up into three different kind of, of categories of plants. The first is desirable plants. These are plants that are important because they provide fruit for wildlife. They may be aesthetically pleasing. One of my favorite shrubs is leatherwood. It's in the genus Durka. And it's I'm not aware that it's good for anything per se, other than it's leathery and you can take the twigs and tie it into a knot. And I just find that so fascinating that whenever I find one, it's just like, it's my favorite plant. And I've only seen it a half a dozen times in my life, but it's just, some of these plants are aesthetically pleasing. You'll want to identify plants if you're collecting firewood, 
Some species are better for firewood than other species. And within all of this uh, desirable, and we're gonna talk about interfering plants next, make a species list. Keep an ongoing list. Uh, you can keep a, put a download, a checklist, a checklist app on your cell phone and just add species to it for the first several weeks or months. You're gonna be busy adding new plants, but after a while that will slow down and it will be uncommon for you to find new plants. This is also a child friendly or grandchild friendly activity. Have them learn, if not the names, just as you can see in this picture, we have yellow poplar or tulip tree or tulip poplar mixed in with some northern red oak seedlings and looks like some birch seedlings. Just have the, the children, depending upon their age, describe the differences. Look at the leaves, what's different about the leaves, look at the buds, what's different, look at the twigs, and so forth. Um, take pictures, they can make a photo album. Um, there's a lot of different ways you can pursue that, but having that list is a fun way to start to understand and learn your plants. Uh, another category of plants that falls in the undesirable are interfering native species. So these are species like American beech, which is pictured that for in many situations interferes with our ability to achieve our ownership objectives. American beech is not a bad plant per se, but it is attacked by an introduced scale, so a non-native insect species that is followed by a non-native fungus. So the white patches that you see are the scale insect and the little red patches are the start the fruiting bodies of the fungus. And eventually this disease insect, or this insect fungus complex, which is known as beech bark disease, kills the tree. Beech, when you damage the main stem, uh, has a physiology that allows it or compels it to send up new plants, new seedlings from the roots. Uh, but they're not truly new, they're genetically identical to the parent tree. So those suckers or sprouts are eventually also going to be, well, they're currently susceptible, but when they become larger, they will become infected, infested and infected by the insect and the fungus. So that's a, that's, that creates the problem. And that problem has magnified itself. The, ins, the beech bark disease started in the US in the early 1900s. Well, it started in maritime Canada, moved to the Southwest, um, and came through New York, I'm told, in the 1970s and had this killing front that was both the, the insect and the disease killing susceptible beech trees and then people cutting beech trees as they were dying because it's great firewood and makes actually pretty nice lumber. The end result of that, the disturbance of the American beech overstory resulted in the strong development of beech sprouts that has continued to this day. This is a look at the five most common saplings in New York. I would guess the pattern is very similar if we look in many of the mid-Atlantic states and the New England states. Beech is the most common sapling. So a sapling is a stem that's at least one, inches in, one inch in diameter up to five inches in diameter. And this is the next forest for me. When we, it's fun to go out and you look at seedlings that are knee high, but if you have saplings, that are in this one to five inch diameter class, that's gonna be the winning tree when the canopy trees die. And the canopy trees will die. They will be harvested for lumber, harvested for firewood, die of natural causes. And so in New York, we have almost a billion beech trees. So 978 million stems is almost a billion. And when you look at which of these are increasing through time, Beech is increasing and balsam fir is increasing. Most recently, there have been fairly significant declines in red maple and sugar maple and uh, ash, which is probably that declines probably not due to emerald ash borer in the saplings, it's probably due to shading. But in any event, we're doing a great job of growing beech and we need to be concerned about that, maybe. So again, we're go, we'll, we'll go back to your objectives and say, how does this fit with my objectives? The good news and the caveat to saying there's too many beach is that I'm not encouraging you to go out and kill all your beach. This picture illustrates um, 
a, a case where we have uh, on the Arnott Forest, this was an area where we had in the foreground, you can see a dead beach. You can see the remnants of bark on the upper portion, the pock marks from the fungus. And then in the center to the rear is a large clean beach. These trees are both about 20 plus inches in diameter. So the larger tree in the back, there is no evidence of scale insect, no evidence of fungus, and yet it was exposed to it because there were these large dead beech all around it. Uh, this was an area that we harvested and we found uh, on average one of these large clean beech per acre. So it gave us an opportunity to do some things to try to make sure that we could perpetuate healthy beech and reduce the abundance of disease prone beech. So in addition to the native undesirable plants, we have um, non-native uh, interfering undesirable plants. Um, and these are shrubs, they're vines, they're grasses, they're herbaceous plants, they're trees. And uh, these, can, these plants are very good at what they do. They can dominate the understory. I'm not where I typically don't find landowners who have an ownership objective that is encouraging of invasive plants. Um, they may not be as offended as other people by invasive plants, but there are a lot of uh, downsides to having the abundance as you see in these pictures. And that's uh, European buckthorn on the left and Japanese barberry on the right. You can see the person standing in the middle of the Japanese barberry. So be able to identify these and, and then you can start to learn how to manage them. But as you're managing them, start to think about, and we're gonna talk more about this later, why are there so many of these interfering plants? If we're out there doing good things in the forest, why aren't we growing? And we, we go out and we look and we see ash seeds and we see cherry seeds and we see acorns and we see maple seeds and um, you know, the seeds of all of the desirable trees that we like, why does it seem like we have undesirable plant species that are flourishing, desirable plant species that are floundering? Um, and, and when you look at the picture, this is a, a collection of sugar maple seedlings that never seems to get any taller. Um, so we start to ask ourselves, is there a selective force that's favoring the undesirable species, which allows them to get bigger and taller and more abundant, and that selective force is operating at the expense of or diminishing the desired species. And we'll keep that in mind. We're going to pick up on it in a little bit. So in terms of tree health, I'm sorry, in terms of tree ident plant identification and knowing your flora, start by learning how to identify trees. There are phone apps that you can download. There's lots of good books depending upon what region you're in. Go to your local uh, forest owner association and talk to other members and say, what's the best tree book? What's the best shrub book for this area? Start a list. Maybe do some kind of an inventory. It might just be how abundant it is or how commonly you find it. And then after you've started to learn something and put a name on it, you can understand the ecology of it. There's lots of resources on the internet. You can Google almost any plant such as the swallowwort that you see pictured and say, tell me more about this plant. What do I need to know? From there, you can say, here's the ecology of this plant. How does it relate to my ownership objectives? Is this going to interfere with what I want to accomplish as an owner? Look to see if there are causal factors that are favoring that. Um, maybe it's the neighbor has a big patch of something that's blowing seed onto your property. Um, on, on property that I own, when I bought it, there was this very large European buckthorn that was loaded with fruit. So first order of business was to take care of that plant. And then I spent, you know, the rest of my time pulling up uh, European buckthorn suckers or sprouts. Um, turns out all the neighbors had European buckthorn, so it was almost in vain. But anyway, it was, I was keeping it at bay. Develop a plan. 
Um, so I jumped ahead of developing the one I just was describing that I had a plan and I executed that plan. And if you're doing it, follow the principles of integrated vegetation management. It's a process. I have other webinars on the YouTube Forest Connect channel. Uh, it's not just a matter of saying I have some um, herbicides and therefore I'm going to go spray it. So you need to learn more about it before you get into that. One of the most common questions I get uh, if I was to look back through email questions was what's wrong with my tree? Why is my forest unhealthy? What can I do? And this I think is a very uniform interest that people have and it's uh, worth spending a little time talking about it. The good news is you likely don't have any insidious problems, anything that's really truly of concern. Although some of you that have a lot of ash trees have um, have some real concerns. Um, but most of the time, forests and trees are healthy. Trees have been doing what trees do for a very long time, and they don't really need us um, to do what they want to do and to, and to be successful at what they do. Also, if there is a problem, and you're hearing about a problem like emerald ash borer, and you should have heard about that several years ago, you have time to develop a solution. So don't let somebody convince you that you need to go out and do something now uh, because there is a bad bug or a bad fungus or bad something in the neighborhood or in the state in, or in the next county over. Um, that may very well be the case, but you don't need to rush into an action. Know that many of these disease agents whether it's uh, defoliation by forest tent caterpillar or defoliation by gypsy moth or um, frost damage or whatever it might be, many of them have symptoms that look the same. So there's some branch dieback, twig dieback, discoloration, uh, small foliage, uh, whatever it might be, the symptoms don't necessarily tell you what the problem is. So you're going to, if you see a symptom of something that doesn't look right, it's going to take a little bit of effort to uh, determine what that causal agent was. And what you do see, so in the picture I'm showing armillaria root rot, is a fungus that can be a uh, primary causal agent of tree death, but more often it's a secondary uh, decomposer. So um, just because you see something that doesn't, something that looks off or bad doesn't mean that that's necessarily causing the problem. So I want to look at three parts of the tree, the crown, the foliage, and the stem, and talk about some, just some health related things. So first of all, I think the crown's probably the best indicator of overall tree health. Um, crowns should be, as most of the crowns in this picture are, full of fine twigs, fine branches. The tree in the middle lacks some of those fine branches and in fact would be what's called a stag-headed uh, tree or a tree that has crown dieback. It does have some live branches. This is a tree in the sugar bush or one of our Cornell Arnott Forest sugar bushes so it's growing in a small kind of wet depression. It's a, it's a, it's a wet area that's the size of your living room but the tree is in exactly the wrong place. Sugar maple doesn't do well. And so problems with the root, sugar maple doesn't do well in wet soils because of lack of aeration in the roots. So these root problems often manifest in the crown. Other problems often manifest in the crown. So look at the crowns. If the crowns are healthy, then the trees are probably quite fine. Dead lower branches are indicative of a closed canopy. These branches don't get enough sunlight and so they die. Now that closed canopy may relate to some at some level to a forest health consideration. Uh, Maybe a concern if you have too many trees, then the trees, some of the trees are going to die because they're being out competed. Foliage is the thing that most people tend to look at. It's very visual. Uh, we like foliage, but sometimes we have current season problems like insects and disease that show up that get people worried, or we have chronic problems like with soil aeration or the availability of nutrients in soils that, that cause chronic problems. The good news with most of these problems, uh, well, with, with, the, with the things that manifest or show up late in the season are typically non-issues. 
So this is tar spot on sugar maple, shows up late in the year, and it's visually distracting to us as humans, to the plant, it's a non-issue. Now, it's a source of inoculum for the future if you get the right humidity conditions and moisture conditions, but it's probably not going to have any measurable impact on the long-term health of those trees. And then finally, we look at the stems. Uh, the stems are important because they support the crown and they connect the crown with the roots. Uh, stem diseases and problems uh, can occur, but they're not common. This is a, a fungal infection of a sugar maple tree in the sugar bush, which is really very ugly. When I look at it, I worry about the structural instability of the stem and the fact that it's likely going to crack and break. And in the pro But before that, this is, so this is a tree that I'm not going to be able to utilize in the future, if that's of interest to me. But at the same time, it's competing for the neighboring trees for sunlight. And so if I'm managing my woods to favor some trees over other trees, this is a tree I would want to remove. Um, and the, the red X is a, is a really good hint for that. But these things aren't common. So if you look at all of the trees pictured, uh, there's maybe one tree on the very far right hand side that looks like it has some kind of a stem issue. But this isn't, it's not something you're going to see most of the time at a high level. Uh, probably in sugar maple, you would be the most common place in high density stands where you would see um, up to 20% of the trees having a stem injury associated with the sugar maple borer. Um, I think about it more as it relates to structural integrity and also if we have wounds at the base of the tree, that may mean that there was a site of infection into the root system that may not show up until you have something that impacts the crown. And so you have a weakened root system in, in year one and year T plus one or you know some decades down the road, you have an ice storm or a defoliation event and that tree really needs to pull on that root system and the root system can't rise to the occasion. Lots of, of course, very problematic bugs those are all over the news, uh, all over the internet. You can learn about them, be conscious of them, but um, unfortunately there's in many cases not a lot we can do. But the biggest problem is I think the impact that deer have. I'll put deer, label it as enemy number one, woodland enemy number one. It's the most destructive force in our woods and it's because of what deer do. And deer are really good at what they do. What they do is they eat plants and they reproduce. This is a sugar maple seedling that has been repeatedly browsed to the point that you almost don't recognize it as a sugar maple seedling. Deer are in the woods and in the process of eating plants can impact thousands of seedlings a day and they come back through and do it over and over and over again. So until we get a handle on our deer problem, the, the interfering plants that they don't eat, right? If deer ate multiflora rose, we wouldn't have a multiflora rose problem. If deer ate tree of heaven, we wouldn't have a tree of heaven problem. So until we get rid of the deer problem or manage that problem, control the impacts either by reducing the number of deer or limiting the access of deer to areas, we're not going to be able to really have the, the outcomes that we want. Lots of resources. I've just shown you uh, two from what I provide through the Forest Connect program publications and then the, the YouTube channel, uh, youtube.com slash Forest Connect where all these webinars are archived. Fourth um, activity, best practice for some people. So this falls out of that universal and into the common or maybe uh, subset of the woodland owners is that trees we talked about need sunlight to grow and it may benefit you to improve the growing space for your trees by giving them more sunlight. So cutting the trees or killing the trees that are around them if particularly you are interested in tangible outputs. If you're trying to grow trees for timber for production, if you're trying to grow trees for sap production, for acorn production, for 
uh, carbon, the allocation of carbon, the faster you're growing those trees, the more they're going to produce these tangible goods. Um, and the faster those trees grow, the more likely they are to produce those things. So vigorous trees, vigorous hardwood stems or vigorous conifers will be performing in, in the way that we want them to because we're going to concentrate growth on the desired stem. So we pick the trees that we want to have more sunlight, we give them more sunlight, they grow faster. We can optimize on a per acre basis typically, or this slide I would should modify that, could be on a per tree basis, and I'll give you an example. We can manage mortality. So as trees get bigger, the forest can't support all of the trees. Some of the trees have to die. So we can go in and we can make sure that the trees that we want to survive have enough sunlight and we can utilize the trees that we think might otherwise die. We can reduce the percentage of trees that have insect and disease problems. That's the incidence. So we might say that uh, in an and without any prior activity, we have 5% of our trees that have serious insect or disease problems. That's going to improve the visual qualities, the safety issues, collateral damage issues. It's probably not going to affect contagion. Most of the insect and disease pathogens that we have are sufficiently widespread that cutting one tree in your woods is not going to, um, it's not going to keep the other trees safe. There's some exception to that, but not very many. But there is in no way an obligation for you to thin your woods. Some people want to go out and enjoy their woods. They want a nice closed canopy. They're not looking for those tangible outputs. In that case, my rec recommendation is don't thin your woods. I would never say that you have to do it. There are consequences to all of our decisions. And, um, and so my goal is to share those consequences or those opportunities with you, but you're not required to cut trees. If you are inclined to say, all right, I want my trees to grow faster, you have to know when you should thin them. So there are at least six different uh, clues that you can use. The first of these is crown competition, just looking up into the canopy when the leaves are out and saying something like, I can't see the sunlight very well. And that's a pretty good indication that probably those trees are competing for sunlight. And if you can stand back and look at them in the upper right hand corner, you see three primary crowns. The crown on the right is full and round. The tree on the left is kind of vase shaped and flattened, particularly on its right side. And then the tree in the middle has a much smaller crown. That tree in the middle is competing and losing the battle for sunlight, the competition for sunlight is being lost by the tree in the middle. So crown shape, uh, size of the crown tells us a lot. Dead lower branches I mentioned is an indication of canopy closure and too much shade. Growth rate of trees is useful. The picture on the top is a Norway spruce log and the two red bars each cover 10 years of growth. So I zoomed in on the picture, I counted the growth rings and I put the bar on 10 rings. What happened with this in this particular situation, this was up in uh, Genesee County in New York, northwestern New York, west of Rochester. It was a plantation of Norway spruce. Eventually the canopy closed. Some trees did well and other trees did not. And the forester that marked this saw something about this tree and said this tree is not winning and marked it for harvest. And so I was able to um, take a take this picture. I'll caution you in that uh, the trees that die naturally are almost definitely going to have slow rates of growth as you see in the outside of this. So if you get a big tree, a winter tree that blows over for some reason and you have the opportunity to dissect it and do an analysis of the rings, take every chance you get to count rings and look at growth rates. And then poor understory development is a function of both shading and also too many deer. Finally, there's a tool that foresters use that's called a stocking chart. And I don't wanna go into the nuances of the stocking chart per se, but it's a mathematical approach that foresters have to say, is your forest or is your woodlot sufficiently dense that it would benefit from thinning? And what they're talking about is stocking. And I've defined stocking as um, 
I think it's the ability of of an of an entity to uh, to receive energy, and so we can think about the number or volume. So we can think about well, I'll give you the example here of an asset. So our asset might be trees, cows, or a soda pop. So the number of trees, number of cows, volume of trees, volume of soda pop that are trying to utilize some resource. So trees are going to utilize sunlight, cows are going to utilize forage, and soda pop, if it's warm, needs to utilize refrigerator space. If you put too many of these assets into an acquisition for that resource, the resource is going to be shared across all of those assets such that all of them will get something, but maybe not enough that any of them really thrive, which might be okay. I mean, that might not be in conflict with your ownership objective. The stocking chart though quantifies and says, here's the stocking we have in these woods and allows a forester to make recommendations. If you wanna do it yourself, which you certainly can do, and you can get a, a state agency forester to come talk you through this process of crop tree management. You can Google crop tree management, but the basic approach is you start again with your ownership objective. You say, what am I looking for? Am I looking for aesthetics? Am I looking for acorn production or hickory nut production or sap production? And you say, what are the qualities of this tree that are going to give me what I want? And those are your crop trees, and it's not a crop like corn that you harvest right away, but it's a crop like a tree that you grow into the future. So you're making an, a long-term investment in, of sunlight into this crop. Eventually, you may harvest that tree, but it's not in the near term, it's in the long term. Walk in your woods and do an inventory and say, you know, if you're looking for red oak trees, to produce acorns for wildlife, then say, how many red oak trees do I have? If you have three or four, then all of those, no matter what they look like, are probably gonna be crop trees. If you have dozens of them or scores of them or a couple of hundred, then you can get picky and you can say, what are the, what are the really important qualities that I'm looking for? And we're gonna talk next about crown position, but that the trees that have a crown and the upper canopy that have nice, wide, full crowns or that's a really important criteria for your crop trees. Mark them 50 to 70 per acre, but you can do a lot less. You might just go out and say, okay, I wanna mark four crop trees and that's my goal for Saturday. And I'm gonna release them by cutting the crowns of trees that touch my crop trees. You did four and that's awesome. Um, or you can do more. So this is another one of those at Scalar. You can do it on a, on a corner, a quarter, a 10th of an acre on three acres, on 15 acres. So crown location, crown position is critical with this. The upper crown trees have proven themselves as winners. All of the trees are gonna be about the same age, if not exactly the same age, but some trees are bigger just because of genetics, because of species composition, because they were in the right place at the right time. Those are the crown trees. That's what you should favor as residual crop trees. In the picture, they're, they're shown in blue. The other crowns, or the red crowns, the lower crown class, they have proven themselves as users. It's losers. It's okay to judge trees. It truly is okay to say, you're a bad tree, and I don't need you, and I'm not going to make an investment of sunlight in you. The upper crown class trees, uh, you can see the data that I show you for sugar maple uh, syrup production uh, each year between the upper and lower crown class trees, anywhere from 50 to 100% better production from upper crown class trees. Uh, Dr. Nyland from uh, SUNY ESF uh, describes a three to eight fold better response when you provide sunlight to an upper crown class tree versus a lower crown class tree. So if you give an upper crown class tree sunlight, increase its sunlight, access to sunlight, its growth response is three to eight times faster more abundant than the lower crown class trees. The way crop tree management works is you identify your crop tree. These, they're shown in brown on the screen. Uh, consider that each crown has, would have four faces and do a release. This shows a four side free to grow. That's FTG, free to grow, four sides. I like to keep the four sided release to trees that are 12 inches and smaller, just because as trees get bigger, um, I've had uh, large trees get a four-sided release and then die. And that's never a fun experience. 
the best trees produce the best results. Crown characteristics are a good indicator of that. The blue dots are the, the trees that I looked at in this picture and said those kind of look like winners to me. And the red dot uh, was a tree that didn't look so exciting. So, and you can go out and you'll see the same thing. This is a good time of the year to get out in the woods because the crowns are not obstructed by foliage. I'd encourage you when you're picking trees to cut, especially those adjacent to your crop trees, to remove high risk stems. So the picture on the right shows the aftermath of the picture on the left. And this is a red maple tree that has two stems. It's a fork, a double stemmed fork. One fork is on the top side, the other fork is hidden and on the bottom side. And what's happened is that fork under the forces of wind and snow has flexed and it's pulled at the wood fibers in the fork. The tree perceives an injury. And so what you're seeing those lumps on the left side and the right side are the callus tissue that the tree is using to try to heal the splitting of the fork. You can see in this case, the, the fork is splitting. It's already started to decay and the stain is there. It's much easier to fell a forked tree when the fork is still intact, not when it starts to split. So this, this flare, this fork flare is illustrated here. I was out actually uh, just before the evening session and I took these pictures. This is the same tree looking at it from 90 degrees. Uh, the picture on the left I'm showing you between the two arrows is the flare. So that's what you're seeing. But if you look at the tree on the right from a distance, doesn't look particularly noteworthy until you get a little bit closer. And you can see to the right of that arrow on the right picture, the, the seam in the fork that's indicative of a fork that's going to fail. Now, with all of this um, abuse that I'm giving to forked trees, know that there are lots of old large trees that have forks. So don't go into your woods and cut every tree with a fork because many, many forks are going to be stable. So be, be judicious. Um, if you don't see that fork, the flare at the fork, it may not be as much of a concern. If you do see the flare at the fork, and especially if you see a seam below the fork, then that's a tree that's probably going to fail. Fifth recommendation is to enjoy some kind of a productive output, whatever it is. Um, so I'm showing firewood and custom sawmilling here. We'll talk about both of those. Firewood is a great pursuit. As I already mentioned, there's a lot of people that like to cut firewood. Chainsaws are a super tool, but they're also a dangerous tool. So you got to love them, but you also got to be very careful with them. How you move your firewood is a matter of personal capacity. Uh, in this case, it's an ATV with a cart. Other people, it's a pickup truck. Whatever you have is what you're going to use. Um, you're, it's okay, certainly, to work cooperatively, but pick your partners. Uh, just because it's your brother-in-law, it doesn't mean you necessarily want to be in the woods with him uh, running chainsaws. Uh, know that all trees are not equal. Uh, there's trees that are much better for firewood than other trees, um, even though they all take the same amount of time to stack and split. Once you get it blocked up and split, hopefully you can dry it for at least a year to reduce creosote and uh, improve the efficiency. Lots of information on YouTube about firewood. Maple syrup, great activity. Another one of those things that's scalar. You can tap three or four trees in your yard and boil it on your wood stove, or you can tap three or 4,000 trees and have a commercial syrup uh, production enterprise. There are, this is uh, admittedly some bias towards things that are available through, through Cornell's maple program. If you're interested in maple production, there's no shortage of ways that you can learn. There's also the cool thing about maple is you can get into it whole hog and you can tap your own trees and boil the, collect the sap and boil it and then sell the syrup, right? That's like all in. Or and you can, you can vary that. Maybe you don't have very many trees, so you work with your neighbor with their permission and cooperation, tap their trees and boil their sap and then work out a barter system. You can sell sap. You could collect the sap and it may be just like, and so for me, the joy is working in the woods and, and figuring out how to get the sap out of the trees. I'm really not that excited about standing next to an evaporator and watching sap boil. 
I love the syrup, but it's that intermediate step where I lose interest. So you can sell the sap, or you might just say, you know, this isn't for me, but I like the thought of a productive woods, a tangibly productive woods, and so I'm gonna lease my trees and uh, somebody else can produce the sap. There are lots of gourmet products, gourmet mushrooms, uh, gourmet medicinal or medicinal plants, so ginseng and golden seal, um, things that are out there. Cornell Small Farms, so smallfarms.cornell.edu has lots of resources that are available, particularly on mushrooms. Custom sawmilling is great fun. I bought, um, I tried to do a, a small sale, small scale timber sale, couldn't get anybody to buy it, so I said the heck with it. It was mostly white pine, and I bought an old sawmill and just had a blast cutting boards. The downside is when you own a sawmill, uh, all the trees that you used to look at and say that's good for the firewood pile suddenly have a one by four board somewhere in the middle. And so some of those trees um, take a circuitous path to end up in the firewood pile. Lots of safety concerns here. You're moving much bigger trees with firewood. You can block it up at the stump. Here you have to move logs, eight foot logs or 16 foot logs or whatever size they might be. Lift them, get them onto the sawmill, and then you use a blade that's very sharp, moving very fast. Most people aren't going to buy their own sawmill, but there's somebody in your neighborhood that owns a sawmill and they'll show up and either on an hourly rate or a board foot rate help you make boards. Safety is critical and whatever we're doing, there are nasty creatures and plants. There are potential injuries from chainsaws, from machines. Uh, we can add uh, um, portable bandsaw mills to the machines and things like drills and hot wax if you're making gourmet mushrooms. And I should add into this, having dealt with a pinch nerve for the pretty painful pinch nerve for the last two months because of improper lifting in the woods and yes I know better and I will never do it again but make sure you are in appropriately good shape and doing things correctly. So how should you put all this together and I'm going to run over a little bit I apologize develop a plan so that means talking with the people that have a vested interest in your property and saying, okay, let's discuss and clarify our goals to make sure we're all on the same page and all of our ideas are on the same page. So what you like on your property may not be the same thing, probably is not the same thing as your spouse or your brother-in-law or your children or your parents. So make sure that everybody that has a play on the property is part of this conversation. Otherwise, if they don't feel like their interests are representative, represented there immediately outside the loop and they're not going to be as likely to cooperate. The plan is going to document what your assets are, the health of the trees, the resources that you have, whether you have trails and access equipment and things like that, and provide some other important functions. Your plan just says who's on the team, so it's the ownership, the those with authority for decision making. It's probably going to be the name of your forester. Uh, it may be the name of your a contact person for your uh, forest owner association, for your soil and water conservation district, your county extension educator, the people that help you with decisions so you know right away how to get a hold of them. It's going to say what you want to accomplish. Here's the end goal. The desired outcome is that I want to have fill in the blank, whatever it is you want to have. What resources are available to you, and then, so the conditions of the trees, the, the trails that you have, whatever it might be, and then how do you get from what you have to what you want to be? That's the short but the long version of a plan. So again, who's involved in the discussion? What do you want to accomplish? There's lots of, I say, products, because one of your products might just be something like a tree species list, a plant list. Um, think about the resources that you currently have. It might be a boundary line survey, um, or there might be resources that you need to get a hold of. And then finally, as you work through a plan, there's lots of technical assistance, uh, New York State Department of Environmental Conservation, private sector foresters, um, foresters from organizations, and then there are groups that don't usually write plans like Cornell Cooperative Extension and NRCS and Soil and Water, but they are 
they have resource people that can be of assistance. So be safe when you're in the woods. That's most important. Rather obvious in the concept of small parcel owners is that this is not a commercial venture for us typically. And so the things that we do ought to be fun and they ought not kill us or injure us. So it's really, there's a lot of people I know, I saw the, the list of the participants, a lot of people that work with landowners. And every year we hear usually at least one story of a landowner that had a really bad day in the woods, like and there's no more days in the woods. And so make sure that's not you. Um, it, it takes the, takes the takes all the fun out of having fun in the woods. Work cooperatively where it's appropriate. Educate yourself and enjoy yourself. So as I close out, and then I'm gonna, uh, I'll stop sharing and uh, we'll open up the chat window for questions. In fact, hopefully you've been typing questions or sharing information in there. There's lots of networks and organizations that can help. Um, this is kind of heavy to Cornell resources, but there's a lot of resources out there. I've talked about a lot of different um, activities for which there are YouTube videos that I've created or that guest speakers have created that are stored on the Forest Connect YouTube channel. So I, and I will, um, I will make this uh, PowerPoint presentation available on a social media site that we have. I'll type that into the chat window. I can't talk and chat. I can't, I can't talk and type. Give me a second. H-T-T-P. Cornell Forest Connect. .com. So Cornell Forest Connect .ning .com. And I think actually when you opened up Zoom, I set it up so that it automatically opens that window for you um, in your browser. I will, I created a blog related to this webinar. There's a fact sheet that I wrote uh, called Managing Small Parcels or something like that that's available for download on that website or it links back to my Forest Connect site. And, um, and there's other resources. I'll put a, a PDF version of this presentation on that website. So hopefully this was useful. You got at least one thing that made it worth your while and worth your time. And uh, now if you have questions, and I see that there are some questions here. So I'll, I'll read through those and I'll answer those. For those of you that are interested in continuing education credits, uh, when you registered to receive your access code, you gave me all the information you need to get continuing education credits. So let's see, and I got to put on my glasses, my screen monitors, tiny text. Uh, Freda's amplifying, and, and so just a reminder, if you are, uh, if you write in a question or a comment, make sure you send it to all panelists and attendees. The default is just to panelists. So Freda says, wish I had heard what you're saying about neighbors long ago, conflict before knowing the neighbors is right. I mean, it's always easier to meet somebody on friendly terms uh, before you have to have a more nuanced or delicate conversation with them. John says, Pennsylvania's adopted into law the purple paint, paint statue serve as no trespassing. Um, I think that's actually a pretty cool strategy. It seems to me Maryland has something similar. I don't remember the color in Maryland. I lived in Maryland 25 or 30 years ago, and it seems like they had a similar color coding that said, if you see this color, it means do not access. So uh, the, the moral to that story is learn what your state laws are regarding posting and boundary line marking. Glenn asks, uh, well, how well do goats work to keep down beech saplings? The goats in the woods project that I ran 20 years ago now, uh, was focused on getting goats to strip the bark from beech saplings. And if you have mature goats, so at least, uh, or mature dentation, so at least a year old, and you supplementally feed them, and you contain them at very high density. So we were, we were running goats at 80 goats, 80 adults per acre. So that's a fairly high density. And uh, they'll go through and they'll eat all the foliage. And at that point, if you have a beach sapling problem, then you probably don't, then you probably have 
almost certainly a deer problem. So you don't have any or very many desirable seedlings. So that whatever the goat seed is not a big loss. Once they consume all the foliage, they will go through and start chewing on the bark and stripping the bark of beech. Um, note that if the plants are still there, the deer won't eat them. And if the deer won't eat them, it's because there's no nutritional value. So if you're gonna put goats in, they have to be in, it's essentially falls under the livestock um, husbandry strategy of management intensive grazing. So it's very intensive, very high numbers of animals on a small area for a short period of time. The short period of time is critical. If you keep them moving, they won't damage. We never had any damage to desirable trees if they were kept moving. When they didn't, weren't kept moving, we did damage some larger uh, desirable trees. Uh, so Pat's talking about deer, open season, no bag limit. Um, I wouldn't be opposed to that. I'm not convinced, and I've given some other webinars recently, that, you know, my take on this is that current recreational hunting opportunities are not going to solve our problem. And I would be in favor of, of commercial hunting, although I think that there's going to be, unless you force landowners to allow hunters to access, which I would not support because that violates private property rights, there's going to be enough refugia that even um, commercial hunting is probably not going to really solve the deer problem. I don't know what the solution is, but I'm not convinced that recreational hunting is going to do that. But it's not going to hurt to shoot some more deer. Andy says, one of my goals regenerate white pine. Deer continue to eat red maple sprouts. The clear areas give the pines the opportunity to grow fast and hopefully get a jump over unwanted species. That's great. So as with many of the actions, we can take which ones support our goals. I'm not sure, Andy, what the question there is. So what I take away from that, two things you have a lot of deer enough that are eating all the red maple sprouts, but not so many that they're eating white pine. On my property, I had enough deer. And there was, and, and it's really not the absolute number of deer. It's the relative, it's the number of deer relative to the available food supply. So where I was, I had a relatively limited food supply. And because of that, the, the, the impacts of the deer, although the herd was relatively small, was enough that they were eating white pine, which is white pine is low on the browse species list. So you have enough deer to keep the red, red maple in check, but allowing the white pine to grow. So that's great. That's one message I get out. The second message is you've been paying attention to the ecology of your woods and that's fabulous. And you've seen the interactions of three different species, two tree species and a mammal and seen how they play out. Um, Freda says, can you share the particular slide? What is the management plan? So Freda, that, I'll, as I said, I'll save that as a PDF and post it to that Forest Connect Ning site. Um, Art says, New York State, historically Maple Beach Forest, how difficult is it to change the composition with natural regeneration? So the natural regeneration process is a, I'll say a, is I'll give the short version. The, the detailed version is quite long. The, what you need to, to change composition is a seed source and then ensure that the seeds are produced. So some of that is just a waiting game, but it may be waiting for the trees to, to achieve enough size so that they're sexually mature to produce the seeds. Uh, and then the seeds have the appropriate seed bed so that they can germinate. The seed seedlings survive to become at least saplings or at least five or six feet tall so that the deer don't eat them anymore. And then that they have adequate sunlight and adequate numbers of plants so that they can grow. So beech birch um, maple forests are, can be naturally regenerated. We don't need to plant trees in the Northeast or the Mid-Atlantic states. Um, you can plant trees. It's a very expensive way to uh, to create a forest when you start planting trees. So hopefully that helps. Uh, I encourage you to go to the uh, Forest Connect YouTube site and do a search for Regen and see what's there. There should be some stuff. 
uh, Tammy says the government site blocks access. Where can I find the recording so I can access via personal computer? So if you go to youtube.com slash forest connect, um, all of the, I've been doing webinars since 2007. So there's a hundred plus uh, webinars that have been archived on YouTube. Andy Freitas says, Andy, don't you have trouble with the beetle that kills terminal bud causing multi-trunk trees? So Freitas talking about the white pine weevil, which is common in most of the area of white pine. I, and I thought of that when, when I first saw Andy's question, that's a good catch for Freida. That's another kind of uh, what's happening in the ecology of the woods. The white pine weevil can be very problematic, especially for pine trees that are growing in isolation and in full sunlight because they have very large succulent central leaders that are attractive to the insect that lay the eggs in that central leader. The larvae grow inside the leader, kill the leader, and then the lateral branches take off and it grow, you grow what are called cabbage pines. So where you have partial shade or high density white pine so that you, and this is a case where growing your seedlings really fast is not necessarily a good thing to do because they become more attractive to this insect. Okay, well that looks like the end of the questions. If I, let me just scroll backwards and make sure I didn't miss anything. All right, well, I hope you all have a great evening. Please uh, practice all appropriate social distancing or I and I can never remember that word, you know, don't get close to other people, especially if you've been exposed or you don't know where they have been. And most of the people that were around, we don't know where they've been. So keep yourself healthy, wash your hands, use sanitizer, and we'll hope that this passes very quickly. So thank you. I hope to see you all in a month, the third Wednesday of April, and it will be warmer then and we'll have more sunlight. Have a great evening. Thank you all.